In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. The creation series tonight will be in Genesis in chapter 1. Genesis in chapter 1, and, and may I say this tonight, it's a blessing to be in the house of God. Uh, it always is. God has been very good to us. Um, <clears throat> I pray that we could be in some way, some fraction, as good to our Lord as He has been to us. I, I don't believe that to be true, but I, I would like to at least be able to strive to that point. I am. <clears throat> Very busy past couple of weeks. We have been wiped out <clears throat> as far as, <coughs> excuse my voice. <coughs> We've been fairly wiped out and on the backside of these busy weeks with the AV conference. The AV conference was excellent. Uh, had a great uh, great meeting there uh, with the Browns in. It was great to have them here. That was tremendous. And then uh, uh, just, just different things, youth club, and, and trying to get everything finished and get things done. Uh, we got youth camp coming up in August. I have brochures in the back for that. That'll be the first full week of August. We'll be up there at Place de la Guerre in the top side of the uh, reservoir. And uh, that's where we're going for youth camp. And then the Holly Dive Bible Club is the last week of, uh, of August here at Sarin. And so we've just been uh, been busy trying to get everything in order, get our ducks in a row, if you will, uh, to make sure things are, are done appropriately and uh, does not catch us off, off guard, which it can easily do at times. And uh, so I do, I do covet your prayers tonight. Uh, continue to pray for for us, pray for our family, pray for all the requests that are that go out on Wednesday night. And uh, so, so we're, we're looking forward to seeing what the Lord is going to continue to do here. We do want a big push over the summer months uh, with the youth. I'm going to try to get a meeting down with the headmaster there at the comp to see what we can do inside the school as well. <clears throat> and work on continuing to see the youth group on Friday night grow. And uh, But we want to see the, the congregation grow on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. So Genesis chapter 1 is where we are tonight, and uh, I ask you if you will, if you're willing and able to this evening, let's stand as we honor the reading of the Word of God. We are going to pick up where we left off last week. We are on day 3. This will be part 2 of uh, a sensational 6 days in our Genesis series. And uh, Genesis chapter 1 is where we are looking. And uh, let's, go, let's go ahead and look at the uh, at verse 9, but our text verses tonight will be verses 11 and 12. The Bible says, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place. Let the dry land appear, and it was so. God called the dry land earth, and gathered together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. God said, Let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. The earth was, and the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good, the evening and the morning were 
the third day. Father, we pray a special blessing upon the reading of thy word. We ask you clearly tonight to please uh, speak to our hearts and our mind. Help us, Lord God, be more uh, fortified, solidified, if you will, on the six days of creation, Father. Uh, Lord, we, we trust our eternal life and it's in your hands. We trust every word of the Holy Script that you've given us here this evening. And Father, we also will trust these six days, six literal days where everything that there is was created. So Father, just help us this evening as we continue to uh, dissect your scriptures, Lord God, to further our understanding of what the first six days of this planet was like. And Lord, we ask you now uh, that you may receive the, press, the precious glory and the praise tonight. We ask these things in the, in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Thank you so much and please be seated. <clears throat> Last time we addressed the book of Genesis, I believe, was roughly three weeks ago. And uh, we, we've had uh, Dr. Stringer and Dr. David Brown in on the Sunday morning. Then uh, Brother Philip Brown was in on Sunday morning uh, last Sunday. Then we had Lord's Table for the last uh, Sunday night of May. So we missed our Genesis series. I believe this we're back on it after three weeks. And uh, just want to give you, the, just <clears throat> reiterate the, the first two points, if you will. Uh, we won't go over them tonight. Uh, but the seas are gathered. We looked at that, point number one. And then we see not only the seas were gather, gathered, um, <clears throat> we see that the land is formed. <clears throat> now, I took a little bit of um, liberty the last time we, we, just, we went over this topic on the land being formed to distinguish the time frame when the lands were separated. Uh, there's, there is a great discussion. There's a great debate over that. Uh, the great debate over the time of when uh, when the lands were uh, separated. There's some people that even like to debate as to whether or not they were even uh, separated. But uh, many people believe that well, God just created it the way it is today, and uh, and that's it. And uh, we know that that's just simply uh, not true. Uh, the Scripture tells us why. We know that the earth separated itself. Uh, we know that God separated the earth in Genesis chapter 10, verse 25, in the days of Peleg. And uh, again, this was just uh, uh, on, the, on the tail end of last week, and I spent some time uh, speaking about that. I gave a few of the arguments, but I'm going to tell you guys, I'm going to be honest with you about this point. I know preachers and, uh, and scholars and teachers, uh, when they do teach on creationism, they teach on Genesis, they give everybody's opinion under the, under the sun. And, they, and, they, they, and, and we've touched on the gap theory, and I believe we shot the gap theory completely out of the water. Uh, but we didn't spend five weeks going over it either, amen? And uh, so whereas I can respect someone to have a particular view on the scriptures, I cannot respect someone when they alter a skew, when they have a miscued opinion of the scriptures. And so uh, by saying that, I'm not going to sit here and go over everybody's opinion on creationism uh, under that topic of when the earth was divided. The reason I'm not going to do that is because I believe the scriptures to be true. We can sit up here tonight and I can tell you about all of the points of a five-point uh, tulip Calvinism. I can, I can go over irresistible grace and I, and I can go over a total depravity of the man. And, and I can go over, you know, I, you know, I can go over all those, all those things uh, tonight with you. Uh, but the reality is I can take you to about five or six verses in the scripture which denounces that type of theology. When the Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, that's it in a nutshell. So I don't believe we need to dissect everything that is wrong in order to prove that which is right. You understand? It's good to have an overview. It's good to have a thought of it. I don't have anything wrong with that. But in the point where we spoke about the land being formed and the days that it was divided, I believe it to be clear. I believe it to be evident. And then we also find that the nations were divided uh, according to tongues and race uh, after the flood uh, by the three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And uh, we know in the days of Peleg is when the Lord divided the land. And so I believe that to be clear, I believe it to be understandable tonight. The scripture teaches us quite well, but that's exactly what it is. So let's look at the one, Genesis chapter one. We'll get into point number three of our, our lesson. This is our first and only point tonight. Uh, but we're going to see that the earth is clothed. The earth is closed. Verse 11 and 12, verses 11 and 12 in Genesis in chapter 1, we find that God has brought forth the earth prior. He saw that it was good. He saw the seas and they were good. And then he says, let forth. In verse 11, and God said, let the earth bring. Now listen, if you take notes in your Bible or if you highlight, there's a couple things in the first chapter of Genesis, the first chapter of the Bible that I think it would be important for you to highlight. One thing is when it says, and God said. And God said. That is important to know. 
You say, well, preacher, I've read it a hundred times. Now, this morning's main topic in the scripture that Nazareth lost a mighty blessing. Why? Because of familiarity. And how often do we get so familiar with, and God said, and God said. We get just as familiar with, with, with reading when it says, and it was good, and it was good. And we forget that on day two, he never said it was good. And we miss a, a principle the size of a, of, a, of, a, of a lorry because we get familiar with the scriptures. Amen. Familiarity is a dangerous, dangerous tool, uh, I believe, that the devil uses or our flesh uses more often. And so don't, over, don't underemphasize when you read in the scriptures, and God said. Verse 11, and God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the earth yield in seed, um, Yield in seed, uh, and the fruit a tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb, yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. I want you to take note here that plant life appeared. Why? Because God commanded it. You say, well, wait a second here. That's a simple. Yeah, it is simple. Told you guys in the Revelation study, I had received a message off, uh, from a guy online that had followed the Revelation series, especially when we started it. And he put on there, he said, he goes, oh man, I'm going to be praying for you. And I appreciate that. I, I, I like anybody praying for me. Amen. And uh, to a certain degree. And, uh, but, you know, I want to pray and pray for me. That's fine. But, but he said, that is one of the most confusing and difficult books in the Bible. And it's not. The book of Revelation is one of the most, is probably the one of the most simplest books to understand the Bible. Not the, but one of the most simplest books. When you rightly divide the scriptures and you read and study and you apply the scriptures where it goes, you understand who is speaking, where he's speaking from, who he's speaking unto, what he's seeing and what he's recording, everything falls into place. And that, that way, when you read even a half a verse, you can take that verse, put it in the timeline where it goes, read this verse, put it in the timeline where it goes. Genesis is the same thing. When we begin to see words, and God said, when we understand that God simply commanded the world the way it is, he spoke it into existence. Hey, listen, he didn't take a billion years for the earth to develop and become like it did here. That's one of, that is the biggest, biggest lie that people have bought into today. Dr. Baker, uh, uh, one of the, the former pastor at Calvary in North Carolina, our city church, uh, Dr. Baker said that he's all for us passing out John and Romans. And I'm with that. The, the John and Romans, we should get into people's hands. That's where people can learn how to be saved. When someone gets saved, that's where they learn. They can learn the scriptures better. They can start their reading off in, uh, uh, in John and Romans. But he says, I think we also, ought to also give them the first 11 books of Genesis. And I mean, a light bulb went off in my head. I thought, wow, that, that's deep. And that's true. Because John and Romans and salvation is not, to, is, is not going to be too difficult to understand when you believe the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. You know, when you believe in God said and it happened, it's much more uh, clearer in your mind that the Lord Jesus Christ would, would, would love us so much that he'd be willing to lay his life down for us. Same one that spoke everything into existence. God the Father thought and God the Son spoke it and God the Holy Spirit went out and moved upon the water. So plant life appeared on the earth simply because God commanded it. I said this a few weeks back. There is only one part of God's creation, only one part of God's creation that looks him in the face and says no, and that's us. When God tells the wind to blow, the wind blows. When he tells the waves to, to roar, the waves roar. When he tells them to cease, they cease. When he tells it to rain, it rains. When he tells the wind to blow, it blows. But when he tells us to do the things that we are to do, many times we are the only part of creation that look God in the face and say no. So when God spoke and said for plant life to appear, it happened. First thing I want you to see here under the earth, uh, that the earth is closed, is I want you to see clothed. I want you to see that plants are created here in this day three. Uh, the praise that you find here, and God said, and God said, God spoke everything into existence. One moment, there was nothing but a barren, dry land. God spoke, and the next moment, the earth's surface was clothed in a glorious paradise of every variety of plant life. Now, in your mind tonight, you may be thinking, wait a second. I thought God spoke it, and then it grew, and you know, it took a few days, and you know, massive plants. You know the old saying, what came first, the chicken or the egg? You know, I know that's deep science, that's, that's deep science, you know. That's easy, the chicken came first. 
Why? Because God spoke it into, he didn't create an egg and a chicken pop out and grow. That's not how it worked. That's not how it worked. God produced the plants. He produced the animals. We'll see that here. He produced them to be able to reproduce immediately. Amen? Now, so he says they, had, they already had seed in their cell. We'll see that here in just a second. We'll break it apart. God spoke, and uh, there was a glorious paradise of every variety of plant life here. Life had begun on day three when he spoke uh, the covering of the earth. <clears throat> The only reasonable argument for the existence of life on this planet is a direct creation from God Almighty Himself. That's the only reasonable argument that we can, we can ever imagine. Life is not accidental. Uh, life is not a byproduct of some chemical reaction. Life is not some type of premarital mo uh, mud hole. Uh, it's not a result of long, uh, evolving, natural processes. It was an immediate result of God's sovereign command. He said, let it be done, and it was done. Now, I'm going to say that to you to prove a point. <clears throat> when you got saved, did you get saved progressively, gradually, or immediately? That quick. You didn't get saved and the seed grow and then ferment and then, you know, fruition. Finally, you know, one day after you, you know, the lights came on. That's not how it worked. God's Holy Spirit convicted us in our heart. Amen. And we said, Lord, save our soul. I'm a sinner in, in need of salvation. And he saved you right then and right there. That was a mighty miraculous work that changes the destination of one soul's eternity. Amen. Never to be removed. If he can do that. Why is it a problem for the world to believe that God said, and then there's a covering? Why in our minds? Now, I'm talking about our minds. I, I talked to you about the dangers of, uh, of imaginations. You know, Genesis chapter 6 tells us that, that the, the world's population, that everything, everything was evil. Their imaginations were just every, it was just wicked, wicked evilness. The imagination of their thought, every imagination of their thought was wickedness, right? Well, the word imagination is a compound word, which means create nations create images and we do that in our mind and so just prior to maybe five minutes ago if we were to say day three god created uh, the grass he brought forth the grass he brought forth the trees and that in our mind we just we tend to default to the point that here they come up grow that's not what the scriptures say you say why are you hammering this point in because i believe in an instantaneous creation that god spoke it into existence Plants and trees ready and able to reproduce immediately. Now, having said that, when I put the videos on the YouTube, it actually has the little plants growing. It hasn't grown quick. You know, I have a little uh, introduction portion for our creation series. And as we, as we move ahead, it goes into day one, day two, day three. It just gives a little an image of what it may or may not have been from an old film years ago. And uh, we grow up thinking that. So don't, that ain't, that's not what happened. God said, hey, let there be a covering. And there was a covering that quick, amen? Evolution has no reasonable argument for the existence of life. They have no reasonable argument to prove uh, that, that we evolved from something. And uh, my argument to them is always to come back and say, well, how come we haven't seen a half monkey and a half man? Now, granted, I played American football. I've seen quite a few people that fit that criteria, amen? Uh, some of them, I was lined up against them. I was going, oh boy, you know? And I found the missing link, amen? And uh, uh, so, I, I, you know, I understand that, but nevertheless, um, it, it's simply not true at all. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I remember, I, I said this early on in the series, I, I want to say it again. Um, <clears throat> I remember watching a documentary one time uh, with this evolutionist that, that was talking about the millions and millions and millions, millions of years that it takes for um, things to petrify, typically wood, or either wood or leather. Uh, anything that is organic will have the properties in it to, to petrify. And to petrify means, you know, to, to turn into stone. And uh, you, we got the petrified forest out in, the, in, in Western America. And uh, it's, it's a neat thing to go see these trees laying down. They look just like trees, but they're actually stone. And it's called the petrified forest. And, uh, you know, evolutionists always go over and they say, oh, it takes millions of years for these trees to petrify. And then all of a sudden in the Snake River, which, is, which goes through the Grand Canyon, uh, which we know was formed by the, uh, uh, by the flood, uh, all of a sudden they pull out these petrified cowboy boots. 
out of the Snake River. Well, they didn't have cowboy boots millions, millions, billions of years ago, amen? Uh, as a matter of fact, Luke Casey goes back and dates cowboy boots uh, into the mid-1800s uh, in the Midwest. And so that shot that theory completely out of the water. Of course, they make all kinds of excuses. But the reality is this, guys, what I'm trying to get to your point in your mind right now, is that God said, and it was so. And if we can understand that in our mind tonight, if we can understand that in our life tonight, if we can get a better understanding that when God says something's going to happen, it's going to happen, it helps us understand that in our mind tonight. If we can understand that in our life tonight, if we can get a better understanding that when God says something's going to happen, it's going to happen, it helps us with the other 65 books of the Bible. Now, there's three divisions of plant life. We'll go over here just real quickly tonight. Number one, there's grass. There's grass, which is spreading ground covering. It's vegetation. Uh, it's a color of plant life. It's green. Uh, most is soothing of, uh, most soothing of colors. Uh, it provides a perfect backdrop for a, for a myriad of color displays uh, by the flowers of God's garden paradise. Uh, we also find in uh, the, the other second division of plant life is that there's herbs. Herbs make up shrubs and bushes, vegetable plants. Do you remember, I said it's a point of another time, but do, do you remember the, 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 uh, the um, what was it called, I just lost it, um, the smallest of all seeds, mustard seed, is a mustard seed grass, herbs, or trees? grows into the prophecy that was given it grows into this big massive tree and people try to take that scripture and they twist it of how what a blessing it is it grew into something that it wasn't belong to be because a mustard seed is an herb and the development of it being this massive thing that Jesus Christ spoke of was saying it, it's something that's grotesque it's something that is growing into something that it does not belong you understand um there's a reason I said that. Actually, I got a series on all those in the back, but um, there's a danger in us. There's a danger in, in local churches. There's a danger in, in us, if we're not careful in our Christian lives, of becoming something God didn't intend us to become. Amen. He intended us to be soul winners. He intended us to live for Him, to praise His name. He intended us uh, to glorify God and uh, not to develop into this massive unit glorifies itself. Thirdly, we find in uh, the three divisions of plant life, we find the, the, the trees, uh, the giant hardwood trees, the evergreen trees, fruit bear trees, whatever kind of tree that you can think of tonight, uh, those were created uh, on that day. <clears throat> Next, we see that seeds were scattered. Uh, the Bible says whose seed is in itself. God did not take plant seeds and wait for them to germinate. We already spoke about this in, in a great way. He didn't wait for them to grow. Uh, they, these these uh, plants were created with the seed already in themselves, ready to reproduce instantaneously right then and right there. He created things that were a full-grown mature, <clears throat> mature plant life already bearing seeds and fruit in itself. That is, the earth had the appearance of age. He had the appearance of age. There was not a gradual process involved but it was instantaneous when God said, let there be, guys, there was. The seed is part of the organism that allows it to reproduce in itself. Uh, each variety of plant contains a, a seed already pre-programmed uh, to, to, you know, to, to produce uh, things just like itself, which is a particular plant's DNA or genetic code. Uh, vegetables have seed in itself, have seed inside. Fruit trees have seed on the outside. God designed it like that so everything will uh, reproduce. Think about the many ways that God has designed uh, seeds to be scattered all over the world. Uh, in our property in Tennessee, when we had these, these things when one field was left unkept. We had these briars grew, that grew up, which is, if, if, if thorns is not evidence of sin, I don't know what is, amen? These things put holes in tractor tires. They were vicious, vicious things, and they stood sometimes 15 feet tall and were that big around down at the base. They were horrible and uh, couldn't stand them. And uh, I was going out there and I was whacking them down and I was bush hogging and cutting them down and just trying to get rid of them. You couldn't grab them anywhere without tearing your hands up. They were absolutely terrible. Well, my neighbor told me he found the tree on his property where all of those things were coming from. 
And he had to treat poison. He had, once he had it poisoned, he had it uh, cut down, then he had it burned. Then he had the stump burned and poisoned. I mean, he was making sure nothing was going to grow this area again. And what it was, was when that tree was left unknown, when that tree began to bloom, it blew seeds. And those seeds fell on the ground. They germinated there and they began to grow up. And if you were able to look, like if I was to stand in, in our field and look toward that tree, you can honestly see the directions that the wind had blown as to where those seeds had grown and the areas in the dips where they wouldn't have, wouldn't have had the wind to carry them that it missed. It, it, it's quite amazing what God, uh, God has done. A dandelion seed, if you think about a dandelion seed, it looks like a parachute that floats, uh, floats in the air and it scatters by the wind. A maple tree is a seed. Uh, it's like a helicopter that goes. Uh, we, we call these little things called hitchhikers or, uh, or called uh, beggar lice as, uh, as well. And, and they get on people or they get on things, they get on animals, and they go and the animal lays down and they plant themselves into the ground. They're deposited. Uh, many times birds will eat uh, they will eat the seed themselves and then uh, through the bird himself and the waste, uh, they would go and, and wherever their droppings went, the seeds would be planted. Uh, one another story of ours, we had this uh, horse that I kept in the barn um, for a while. She was a black Percheron horse, a gorgeous horse, uh, mean as the day is long. She only liked my wife. She didn't like me. Uh, she was just mean. And uh, I didn't like her too much either, but she was, she was beautiful. And I used to see her black oil sunflower seeds. Uh, to, to, to darken her coat and make it real shiny and I would feed those things and I just got tired of keeping her in the stall uh, at times but when I would clean the stalls out I would throw that stuff in the back of my truck and I would go dump it in our garden and one year we didn't put a garden in and so we're out having a cup of coffee in the, in the back room in the sunroom uh, one morning and I happened to look out where the garden was guess what was growing out there big massive sunflowers and I mean with big heads on them and everything I said look at that Denise that was from the barn that went into glory be came out of her that I cleaned up with my truck and I went and dumped it in the garden and there it is. It is a beautiful picture of how God designed these things on day three after his kind. Three times we find in verses 11 and 12 he says after its kind. Ten times in Genesis chapter 1. It is an impassable chasm that has never been altered that we reproduce after our kind. A dolphin does not produce a bass. A bear does not reproduce a cougar. Listen, a dandelion does not reproduce a sunflower. Okay? It's just the way it is, the way God designed it on day three. It's a divine decree that makes evolutionary science absolutely positively impossible. Impossible. Amen? And amen. So we'll uh, continue to move on. And uh, I think that's actually going to be it here in just a moment. Look at verse 12 with me. The Bible says, And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielded seed after his kind, and the tree yielded fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. So that two days there, the evening and the morning, were the third day. At the end of the day, uh, there God looked out, looked out over all of that which he had created, everything that he had brought forth, everything that he had, had spoken and existed, and pronounced it to be good. And that word carries with the idea of satisfaction in what God had accomplished that day. God was pleased with what he had created on day three with the covering of the land. Now, if you'll go back in your mind to the previous part in day three, and we, we saw all of the land masses together, okay? Now you understand. God said, let, there, let it be, and it was, right? And all the grass, and all the seeds, all the trees and all these different things were planted there. And in the days of Peleg, of course, we know after the flood, there was all kinds of, uh, uh, of climactic changes that occurred because of the flood, that the uh, massive uh, water uh, had been turned loose and fallen right here. Uh, people began to live shorter and shorter and shorter dramatically uh, after the flood. And uh, so we know that things change in a great way. But that's how you see that the whole world was populated in one shape, form, or fashion. Sure, when the climate changed, you get, you get uh, the ice, the frozen areas. You get the places that are, are not going to have the greenery as, say, you know, Wales would have or as South America would have. And, uh, but nevertheless, that was how God created everything. When you had one massive landmass, God said, let there be a ground cover. All right? God said, and it happened. Amen. And that was the close of day three. The evening and the morning were the third day. And God said that it was good. He was satisfied with that which he had accomplished. 
So let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you.